Hey guys, so over the last couple of days, a lot of new Senate polls have been released for this year's elections in November. We've got even more new polls from Ohio showing Tim Ryan ahead by double digit leads. Right now, we really may start the conversation as to whether or not Tim Ryan can actually defeat JD Vance in a head to head matchup. We also have new polls from Pennsylvania showing John Fetterman leading by significant margins over Meme Oz. A new poll from Arizona after Blake Masters officially won the Republican nomination, and of course polls from New York, Connecticut, and Georgia as well. So in this video, I'll be taking a look at these new numbers and what they mean for this year's Senate elections as it gets more and more competitive. Right now, Democrats and Republicans are now tied on the generic ballot for the first time in almost a year, so we're really seeing very tight races in many states that will really have a major impact on the political environment for the next two years. So starting off with the race in Ohio, we got three new polls showing Tim Ryan up by double digits. I mean, really, these are pretty significant numbers for the Democratic nominee. J.D. Vance, though, for the Republicans, barely won his nomination, even with the endorsement of Donald Trump winning only a third of the vote. And J.D. Vance has no previous campaign experience in running for political office. So Tim Ryan, he has much more experience in running campaigns like this. He's won 10 races in a competitive House district in the last 20 20 years, and J.D. Vance really is struggling. If you look at the polls for this race, on average, Ryan leads by a margin of 4%, and the three most recent polls show him leading by 11 and 10%. Now, if you do look at these polls, though, the polls that have showed Ryan ahead over the last three months really have not been the best. If you look at six of these polls, they were conducted by SurveyMonkey, a C-rated pollster. Basically, SurveyMonkey conducts online polls, so even though they do choose their own subjects, it really is not the best way to perform polls, and these other four polls were funded by partisan sponsors. However, the one poll that really is significant here is the poll funded by the John Bolton Super PAC, a Republican sponsor, actually putting Ryan ahead by 6%. So Tim Ryan is definitely doing a lot better than what most people expected, but right now he is still not favored to win this race against Vance. If you look at the Senate map here, according to 538, they do still have the state of Ohio as a likely Republican state. J.D. Vance has a 76% chance at victory, so very close to being a lean state at this point, and the odds for Republicans have continued to go down over the last couple of months. At the very beginning, when this forecast was first launched, Vance had a 90% chance at victory, but now he's only expected to win by a margin of 6%. This is weaker than Trump's margin in both 2016 and 2020, and he only has a 3 in 4 chance at winning. According to DDHQ, the odds are slightly worse for Vance. Currently, according to Decision Desk HQ, JD Vance only has a 72% chance at winning his first six-year term in the Senate. So the state of Ohio, things here are not going well for the GOP, but the main thing that's going to probably drag them across the finish line is the fact that Ohio has become a very Republican state in recent years. However, it is really going to be one of the most surprisingly competitive races. I do think Tim Ryan has a chance, but in the end, he is still not the favored candidate. So right now, Ohio, I do still have as a likely to lean Republican state, but according to the polls, Tim Ryan does hold a pretty solid 4% lead. So according to our map here, Ohio is actually only going to be a lean state and for the Democrats and not the GOP. Moving on to Pennsylvania, John Fetterman leads by solid margins in the three polls conducted by SurveyMonkey against Meme Oz, and really there are very many similarities between the Pennsylvania and Ohio races. We do have particularly strong nominees in Tim Ryan and John Fetterman in both of these races, and I don't say that about every single Democratic nominee. I think some of their nominees, like Raphael Warnock, as well as even Catherine Cortez Masto, honestly are much more average nominees compared to Tim Ryan and John Fetterman. These two nominees were very good choices by the Democratic Party, and they are running against Republican nominees that really are struggling, GOP nominees that have had absolutely no previous campaign experience. J.D. Vance has never run for office before, and Mehmet Oz, of course, has never even lived in Pennsylvania. He spent his entire life in New Jersey, and even though he's running for this seat, he still spends most of his time in his home state, and that really is affecting this race. John Fetterman is, of course, the lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania, and that really is a big reason as 
as to why he's doing so well. Out of these two candidates, John Fetterman is the only one that actually has something to do with the state. And typically, voters do not like to vote for politicians that are just running in their state for absolutely no reason if they have no connection to the people they are trying to serve. So if you look at the polling average here between Fetterman and Oz, John Fetterman currently leads by a margin of 10.8% against the TV personality. And I mean, these three new polls really are not that different from the other polls that we've seen. We've seen John Fetterman lead by double digit margins in many of the previous polls over the last couple of weeks. And this, these new polls would really just further cement the lead that John Fetterman has. Now, yes, Democrats do typically underperform in the Keystone State, but not by 10%. If John Fetterman leads by an 11% margin, he is definitely ahead in this race. And if the election was held today, 100%, he would win. However, of course, the election is still in three months. And yes, things can change. But right now, the overall trend is not looking favorable for the Republicans as they fight to hold on to the seat, one in which they currently have the incumbent in, which of course is Pat Toomey. He is not running for re-election this year, and that really has been a big problem for him and the GOP. So if you look at the state of Pennsylvania, according to 538, they have it as a lean Democratic state. John Fetterman has a 2 and 3% chance at winning this race. And if you look at the odds for Democrats over the last couple of months, I mean, when the forecast was started, they had a 35% chance of winning. Their odds have almost doubled now, and John Fetterman is currently expected to win by a 3.2% margin, which would be three times the margin that Joe Biden had over Donald Trump here in the 2020 presidential election. So yes, again, Democrats are doing very well in Pennsylvania. I've said that many times before, and these new polls are not any different from the overall trend that we're seeing. So right now, according to the polls, the state of Pennsylvania is going to be a likely Democratic state, but in the end, it's probably going to be a lean state. The state of Pennsylvania is going to tighten up in the next couple of months, at least in the final weeks leading up to the election. But really, things are not looking good for Mehmet Oz, and his campaign is not doing well in terms of finances either. So the GOP really is going to have to figure something out if they want to hold on to the Senate for the next two years. And next up in Arizona, we got quite a few new polls from the race here between Blake Masters and Mark Kelly. One of these polls was conducted from the 4th to the 2nd of August, so basically when Blake Masters won his primary, and this poll puts Mark Kelly up by 5%, and it's a poll funded by the American Next Super PAC for the GOP, and a previous poll showed Kelly up by 5, and this was funded by the Republican Super PAC Saving Arizona. So the numbers right now are not looking good for Blake Masters, and I mean again, we are seeing some pretty similar stories in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Arizona. All three of these races are very similar in many ways, with Blake Masters also being a candidate that has not run any political campaigns in the past, and someone who is seriously struggling. Now, I will give Blake Masters a bit more time. He only just recently won the Republican nomination, but we now do have a polling average between him and Kelly, and Mark Kelly currently leads by an 8.6% average, and Mark Kelly is positively approved of in his state, unlike Kirsten Sinema, and it really is going to be very difficult to unseat this Democratic incumbent. He defeated Martha McSally in 2020 by a multi-point margin, and in 2020, his victory was one of the only four flips for the Democratic Party in two after the general election in November. So Mark Kelly's win in 2020 was one of the big ones that helped Democrats flip the Senate after the election of Joe Biden. And in 2022, it does look like he is going to hold on to a seat. If you look at the 538 forecast for this race, Mark Kelly currently has a 68% chance at victory. So very similar to the Pennsylvania race, but Mark Kelly has a slightly bigger advantage just because of the incumbency that he has. So even though he is polling not as well as John Fetterman, he is still probably going to win this race with a high percentage chance at victory. Blake Masters is currently expected to lose by a margin of 3.6%, and the odds here have been going up for Democrats over the last couple of months as well. Basically a trend that we're seeing everywhere nationwide. We're seeing this in many gubernatorial elections as well. And if you look at the generic ballot, I mean, it's no coincidence that Republicans have now lost their lead. According to Decision Desk HQ, Arizona is a lean Democratic state, giving Mark Kelly a 78.2% chance at winning. And I mean, just look at the fundraising for this race. Blake Masters has raised $653,000 from contributions, while Mark Kelly has made $13.1 million. So I mean, the fundraising in basically all of the major races this year are going to benefit Democrats. They do have a lot of incumbents, which is a good way for them to fundraise money as well. Incumbents have 
of years to fundraise for their next political campaigns. But Mark Kelly is in a very good position right now going into his re-election. If you look at the polls, he's up by almost a double-digit margin. And, I mean, Blake Masters only barely won his primary. I'm sorry, that was the New York page. But if you look at the Arizona page right here, Blake Masters only won 39% of the vote. We have 80% of votes being counted, but the numbers aren't going up too much for Masters. He definitely did underperform a lot of expectations and only barely defeated Jim Lehman and Mark Bronovich, who came in a distant third. If you added up the votes for all the other candidates, he would have lost by a 20-point margin. 60% of Republicans did not vote for Blake Masters, and that is going to be an issue for him going into the general election. When you have competitive primaries like this, the Arizona primary was one of the most competitive ones over the last two years, and when you have a primary like this, it is going to hurt the eventual nominee if they cannot even win even close to a majority of the votes. So right now, Arizona is going to be a likely Democratic state based on the polls, but just like Pennsylvania, it is probably not going to vote for Democrats by a margin larger than 5%. It is still the year 2022, and Democrats are probably not going to do exceptionally well at all. If you look at the DDHQ forecast, though, Democrats are doing pretty well. According to them, there's only one toss-up race left, and that is Pennsylvania, as Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada are all lean states now, according to this forecast. I do definitely disagree with these three calls. I think that Nevada is a much closer race, and Georgia honestly should not be a lean Democratic state at this point. I think that Democrats are doing even better in Pennsylvania than both Arizona and Georgia. So right now, the map is looking favorable for Democrats, but they are going to have to hold on to this momentum that they have. And over the last couple of years, we've seen all races get closer as October comes, and we're probably going to see the same thing in 2022. So Democrats really should not get too relaxed at this point. The GOP wave may not be as strong as it originally was, but they are still very much in this race. All right, and now moving on to New York, we have two new polls for this race. The first two polls released for the matchup between Chuck Schumer and Joe Pinion. These polls were conducted by Emerson College and Siena College, both A-rated pollsters, so pretty reliable polls, these two, that show Chuck Schumer up by 22 and 21 points. Chuck Schumer is definitely going to win his re-election. According to 538, he has an over 99% chance at winning, and according to DDHQ, his odds also stand at over 9 99%. Of course, Chuck Schumer is the current majority leader and leader of Senate Democrats. Joe Pinion doesn't really stand too much of a chance in this race. Pinion is a former television host, and this is also his first political campaign, so the GOP really is nominating a lot of newcomers. He is a bit more of a moderate Republican, but if you look at all of the ratings for this race, every single political prediction here has the race in New York as solid 40 Democrats. However, if if you look at the gubernatorial race, you will see a bit of a closer matchup between Lee Zeldin and Kathy Hochul. Hochul only leads on average by 16%. And if you look at the same polls that showed Chuck Schumer up by margins of over 20%, Kathy Hochul only led by margins of 14 and 16%. Hochul is incredibly unpopular in New York. The only thing that's keeping the state afloat for her is the fact that the partisanship in the state is a plus 16, a plus 20 for for the Democrats, but in the end, Kathy Hochul is going to win her re-election, despite her being a pretty weak candidate. She did win the Democratic nomination, though, after being the incumbent governor, only because of the resignation of Andrew Cuomo. So the governor race in New York is going to be much more competitive than the Senate election, in which Chuck Schumer is guaranteed to win. So I already have New York filled in. It's obviously going to be a very solid state for Democrats. And now we have just two more races left to look at. These two races in Connecticut as well as Georgia. I mean, just so many new Georgia polls over the last couple of days that we just have to look at. But if you look at the new polls from Connecticut, Richard Blumenthal only leads by 11 and 12% margins against Leora Levy as well as Themis Clarides. So Jim Jordan, his campaign is the one that sponsored these polls. So obviously it's going to be skewed in favor of Republicans, but the most recent polls really have not 
up in the greatest for Blumenthal. Connecticut may be a likely Democratic state with Blumenthal winning by a margin of less than 15%, but I think that he's almost guaranteed to win by double-digit margin nonetheless. If you look at previous polls conducted by Emerson College, Blumenthal led only by 11% against Themis Clarides, who is the Republican frontrunner for the nomination, and in the most recent poll, even though it was funded by a GOP sponsor, Blumenthal still only led by a margin of 11%. So we will probably see a margin very close to 15%. Whether or not that's above or below is not really going to matter too much. Democrats are going to hold on to their seat in the state of Connecticut. And right now, of course, we have a pretty competitive primary between Clarides and Levy. And of course, every single rating for this race has it as solid Democratic, except for RCP, which actually has the state being likely. However, if you do look at the 538 forecast, Democrats have a 97% chance at victory, and according to Decision Desk HQ, their odds stand at over 99. So just in New York, the state of Connecticut is already filled in as a solid state for the Dems as well. And now finally in Georgia, this is the last race that we have at new polls from Raphael Warnock, of course, is doing very well in the state. On average, he's up by a margin of 3%. And I mean, if you just look at these polls that were conducted just last week, Warnock led by 3 and 4%. And polls in Georgia have been famously accurate, unlike states like Pennsylvania or North Carolina, where Republicans almost always overperform expectations. Polls in Georgia have been spot on, especially in the 2020 elections. Polls were said to be very inaccurate in 2020, but really in Georgia, they were one of the best. And in 2016, polls were not too far off from the eventual results either. Same thing in 2018, Brian Kemp did lead in most polls, and he defeated Stacey Abrams by a 1.4% margin. Most polls did have it as a very close race, with Abrams even leading in some of those polls. However, the big issue here for Republicans is the fact that, yes, Democrats are leading with Ralph and Warnock over Herschel Walker in the Senate race, but in the gubernatorial election, the GOP is up by 5%. Even if you think polls are wrong, if you think the polls are going to be wrong in Georgia, these are the same polls. When polls are conducted for the Senate race, they're conducted for the governor race as well. So these are the same voters, and there is a lot of ticket splitting here with Brian Kemp up by 5 and Herschel Walker down by 3. So yes, even if these polls are supposedly fake, the GOP is still doing terribly in the Senate race as Herschel Walker is doing 8% worse than Brian Kemp in the governor race, and of course Georgia is one of the most purple states in the country, and 8% is very significant in a race like this. However, the polls in Georgia should be believed. Raphael Warnock does have a commanding lead in this race currently, and he probably is going to win his re-election. According to 538, he has a 50% chance at winning, so 538 is very conservative with the Georgia prediction. They do give Warnock a very slight edge, though, if you look at the predicted result. Warnock is expected expected to win by a margin of 0.6%, but not quite 50%, because of course in this race, you do have to win a majority of votes. Georgia is one of those states in the South that require a runoff election if no candidate reaches 50% in the first round, and so of course in 2021, Ralph A. Warnock won the runoff election against Kelly Loeffler. That was how he won his first two-year term, and now he'll be running for his first full six-year term in Congress. And so 2022 is looking like a better and better year for Warnock, as Herschel Walker's campaign has been proven to be a pretty weak one. He is not that great of a campaigner, and again, another Republican that has never run a political campaign before. You could say the same thing about Warnock, but I mean, his words on the campaign trail in 2020 were received much better than those of Walker, and Ralph and Warnock, despite Joe Biden not being approved of in Georgia at all, Warnock does still have a favorable approval rating in the state, just like Mark Kelly does in Arizona, and this is the issue for many Republicans that are un trying to unseat these incumbent Democrats in close races like Nevada, Arizona, or Georgia. The Democratic incumbents simply are popular ones. If you did have Jackie Rosen in Nevada or Kirsten Sinema in Arizona on the ballot, it would be a bit easier for the GOP, but the candidates that we do have this year for Democrats are making this race much more favorable for them overall, the overall Senate race, that is. And so if you look at the 538 forecast, I mean, Democrats are clearly favored here. And if you look at the DDHQ model, Democrats have a 69% chance at victory. I mean, the odds just continue to go up for them. And what I mean by Democrats being significantly favored is that 538 has always been very conservative with calling 
Georgia. Georgia has always been a state that they favor Republicans a little bit more. And so 50-50 in Georgia is pretty significant for a forecast from 538. But DDHQ is much more liberal with their projections. And so right now, they predict 69% chance that Democrats win. And I mean, just look at the fundraising here as well. 10 million for Warnock, 3 million for Walker. And Walker had been the frontrunner in this race over the last two years. He received the endorsement of Donald Trump before he even announced his campaign. He was basically the first Senate endorsement by Trump. And so right now, according to the polls, Georgia is going to be a lean Democratic state. Another win here for the Democrats if we based our map based solely on the polls. Now, of course, I would never base any of my maths based on polling data alone. There are a lot of other factors that affect election results, not just the polls, but also how inaccurate they can be. Fundraising numbers are also very important to look at, but also just the national environment and how both parties have been trending in each of these races. So no, I do not believe that Democrats are going to win in Ohio. This map is simply a map that we're going to look at based on the polling data that we have. So I should actually put Connecticut as a likely Democratic state. And so looking at all of the most recent numbers, yes, Democrats are doing well, but they should not be relaxing right now. 2022 is going to be still a good year for Republicans. Even if they don't win back the Senate, they're still going to make gains in Congress. According to 538 here, the Democratic Party only has a 19% chance at holding on to the control of the House, 81% for Republicans, and Democrats are pretty vulnerable in a lot of gubernatorial elections as well, especially in Kansas. It is still 50-50, but in the end, Derek Schmidt is still slightly favored in this race. Democrats are also in a very tough race in Arizona with Carrie Lake as the Republican nominee. She probably would have done worse than Robeson, but still, the Arizona race is going to be a big one after Doug Ducey won by 14% in 2018. So yes, things are looking up for Democrats overall. I mean, just look at all the most recent polls that we've gotten. This is every single poll. I'm not deleting or hiding any of the polls. Basically, all of them should Democrats ahead in the competitive races. I mean, polls from Georgia, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Arizona consistently show Democrats leading in New Hampshire as well. And the most recent poll from North Carolina put Beasley up by 2%, and this was funded by the John Bolton Super PAC. So the genetic ballot is also looking good for Democrats right now with both parties at an even race. But 2022, you cannot underestimate the Republican Party. And these latest polls, even though they do show Democrats doing well, the GOP definitely cannot be counted out. And so that is why I'll continue to keep you guys updated on the 2020 two races, but 538 currently gives Democrats a 58% chance at holding on to the upper chamber and 627 according to DDHQ. So right now, this is the Senate map based solely on the polls. I'm going to fill in Nevada as a lean Democratic state as Masto leads by 1.5%, but definitely this is not going to happen. We're going to see a much closer race, and the polls are simply an indication as to the fact that Democrats are doing better than they were before.